Um, so this is the continuation of special lecture series on Galvin's numbers and gamma Whitman invariants. One way or another, we are trying to prove modularity properties in these enumerative uh, geometries. Um, so, so far, we did uh, somehow proof of escalality modularity conjecture for generating series of certain sheaf invariants. These were sheaves with two-dimensional, two-complex dimensional support, and they were supported on the fibers of a K3 fibration. Today, I will tell you sheaves which are supported on one-dimensional subschemes of the ambient variety. And again, they are supported on their sub their support also is supported on a, on on fibers of the K3 fibration. Now, why is it that we are putting so much emphasis on K3 fibrations? Ultimate goal is to prove these uh, modularity properties and this escalarity conjecture for more general sheets, sheets which are supported on divisors which float around randomly any way they want inside some ambient, hopefully compact. Calabria threefold, like Quintic threefold. That was the importance of that conjecture. And the idea is that later I will show you using degenerations and so on, we can, we can relate that very kind of much harder, difficult, much difficult problem to the K3 fibrations. So if you understand K3 fibration series very well, you understand other theories as well via degenerations. So, so let me, so the story today and the next time is about stable pair invariants. So forget about sheaves of dimension 2, complex dimension 2. Now we are thinking of sheaves of complex dimension 1. So let's start by defining our geometry again. Let x be a smooth projective threefold. I will just tell you first some general facts about the stable pair invariance over complex numbers over C. And now for beta, some homology class in the integral homology <coughs> of the stable index, and some integer, some integer, the moduli space, the moduli space of stable pairs, which is denoted, uh, um, introduced, first of all, this was introduced by Andre Ponte, Andre Ponte, and Thomas, um, denoted by P and X of beta. pairs, and x beta parameterizes, parameterizes the following data. So parameterizes pairs, let's call this S, a map from structure sheaf of the, uh, the ambient threefold to a sheaf F. So why is it a pair? Because really it's a sheaf together with its section. It's a pair of data. Okay? And now I need to fix some numerical invariance about this sheaf. So such that where first of all F is a pure one-dimensional sheaf, is a pure sheaf. Sheaf with one-dimensional support. So purity means torsion freeness over its own support. If it is pure on the whole threefold, then it's just torsion free. But this torsion free on its own support. So it's a pure one dimensional sheath um, with one dimensional support on X with uh, the following uh, data. First of all, the homology cycle of F is equal to Beta and um, quite a characteristic of that is equal to n. 
And also, and moreover, by some stability condition, you always construct a parameterizing scheme of these things, and in order to get to a modulized space, you need to fix a stability condition. So by some stability condition, you would like the section to satisfy the property, property that by stability, the co-kernel, the co-kernel sheet of the section S, um, we want it to be zero dimensional. We want it to be supported, as supported on zero dimensional subschemes. And these subschemes, these zero dimensional subschemes, are not randomly floating around inside X, they're actually on the curve. And so if you want to know what's the story, if you have this curve, for example, I mean, this is the, sh this technology of stable pairs invariance was really um, kind of uh, invented because Fonny and Thomas, they wanted to find a better version of doing something, calculating something like gram wooden invariance. The gram wooden moduli space is a compactification of moduli space of the smooth curves, because that guy is uh, open. And the gram wooden moduli space gives you a choice of boundary for this compactification where the boundary is given by stable max. And the stability of the stable max is obviously complicated. There's this recipe. There's another compactification where instead of curves, you can look at ideal sheaves of curves. And as soon as you think of that, that marginalized space is the Hilbert scheme of those curves. So Hilbert scheme also is a different compactification of the marginalized space of the smooth curves, together with the stability condition for ideal sheets, which is the just the Giesecker stability. The Hilbert scheme picture, however, has the problem that if you have ideal sheets of functions vanishing on one-dimensional subschemes, the one-dimensional subschemes is not just the naked curve. It's a naked curve together with, it, with its non-reduced structure. And if you want to think of pictorially, it, it has zero-dimensional subschemes. So ideal sheaf of a curve is not just ideal sheaf of some picture like this. It, this thing would have zero-dimensional subschemes attached to it, and also some things that float around inside X. And so when you calculate the invariance of these things, even though these are integers, and that's what physicists wanted. When you calculate the invariance of these things, the problem that the physicists arised was we are not counting curves yet. We are counting some pictures like this. We want to count really just curves. So they were interested in a situation where these points floating off of the curve are somehow deleted from the picture. So then there was this another recipe on which we wanted to count curves with with zero-dimensional subsystems only lying on the curve. Like, if you want, you can think of these as markoids. And the stable pair invariants are analogs of these things. Sheaf theoretic objects that do, do give you a picture like that. So for example, they have, you can get the stable curves many ways. But as an example, if you have a curve and a divisor, divisor, let's call this P, on this curve, this divisor gives you a line bundle of functions having holomorphic poles along it. So there is this line bundle, obviously, that you can construct from this divisor. It's a bundle on the curve. And it has non trivial section. So there is a map. You can call that S prime, which is a non trivial section. It takes you from O of C to O of CP, the line bundle. But then, if you want to study things in ambient threefold, and if you want to study deformations of these things in the ambient threefold, you want to write all of these modules with respect to all x modules. So if ambient threefold is x, then you will have structure sheaf of x surjecting onto structure sheaf of the curve. And this naturally, this map is injection. This naturally gives you a map from here to here. So if you look at this now, like that, you will get O of x and a map. I call this thing S prime. I call this thing S. 
together with the push forward of something which is purely supported on a curve in the ambient threefold. And so this is what I would call F. F is really the push forward of this guy via the embedding map that sends the curve on to X. So this is why stable pairs matter. They are chief theoretic objects, and there's translations of pictures like this. And their moduli space gives us a choice of compactification of the moduli space of the smooth curves. These are the closest, by the way, chief theoretic objects to Raman Witten invariants. The Raman Witten Downs and Thomas correspondence, the fact that these two theories are really counting the same thing, the actual correspondence is between stable pair invariants and Raman Witten invariants. So this is what Pontrepani and Pixton proved. Um, and then, oh, they didn't calculate things, but they proved that both theories give you the same kind of, I mean, if you can calculate invariants on this side and on that side, they would match. This is what they proved. Even though they didn't do the calculations, but the statement is in between stable pair invariants and Gramma Witten invariants. And then going from Gramma Witten all the way to Donaldson Thomas has to do with making a second connection between PT theory, stable pair theory, and Donaldson Thomas theory with you know, ideal sheets, but that's much easier. Much easier. That's a wall crossing calculation. And which is done motifically and non motifically. So motifically by Yokinoku Toga. And non motifically by Bridgeland, actually. So going from PT to DT is easy, but going from Gramma Witten to PT was really, really hard. Okay, so these are stable pair invariants, and now we are studying these stable pair invariants. So you see, I wanted to draw this picture because I wanted to, you to think that stable pair invariants are objects that they to correspond to pictures like this, and I want these pictures to lie on the Fibers of the K3 vibration. Okay? So I have this K3 vibration X, and I have a sheaf which is supported on something like this, together with the section, and I want my sheaf to be supported on the K3 fiber of the vibration. Okay. So PT constructed um, perfect construction theory. And uh, of as a virtual class, virtual class which sits inside zero homology of the modular space, which gave them a way of calculating the variance of these things by integrating one against this zero dimensional virtual cycle. Same way that Melissa discussed yesterday. The virtual class here is also zero dimensional. So those are stable pair invariants. And so they did this for Columbia's reports. The zero dimensionality of the cycle has to do with Serdan. Now let us assume um, that X admits a vibration a morphism I, I, have a, I have a curiosity. So this is after probably more than a decade of this is the original definition, but but after more than a decade, if this invariant has more general, this more general, more general setting. Uh, this yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and this is just an example. You can get stable pairs other ways too. I just started with an example that I have a curve with the divisor on it and all that. I mean, for example, this is the case. You, your f is actually only rank one, right? Yes, yes, yes. But for example, after a decade, is there? Or yes, that's right. In fact, in here, we are not, no, we don't have rank one necessarily. Even in the original picture, 
f could be any rank. The stability condition doesn't care about the rank of f. You know, it doesn't have to do with that. Um, the real story is that there is a spectrum, there is, there is some moduli space of stability conditions for objects like this. And um, one is spectrum of the moduli space. Okay, so the stability condition they use is called Lipotier stability. Lipotier stability has a parameter. It's a real number. It starts from zero, it goes all the way to infinity. On one side, for parameter being very, very small, close to zero, objects like this are stable as long as this guy is semi-stable. That's called Joyce Song invariance. That has its own applications. And I will talk about it later when I talk about log classes. And then you perturb the stability condition, you make it large as, as much as possible. On the infinity side of the real line, close a very, very large parameter. Your moduli space stabilizes. There is no more chambers that it experiences. There is this dominant chamber at very large parameters of the stability where objects will become stable as long as the co-kernel of this map is a zero-dimensional sheaf. Kind of the stability of this sheaf will be, will disappear from being affected. So the stable pair invariants don't care about the sheaf, but they care about the co-kernel of this map. That you can just pick as, only thing I want to know about PTS stable pairs is that co-kernel of that map, I want to be zero-dimensional, and I want my sheaf to be pure one-dimensional. Not rank one, but one-dimensional. Pure one-dimensional. Okay. So let's assume that our x admits a morphism to C, where C is a smooth projective um, curve. So it's a uh, geometric fiber. The geometric fiber is a smooth um, K3 vibration. And what is that supposed to be? The morphism pi is called a K3 vibration if um, The morphism is called as k fiber. That's so we have this morphism onto a curve, and the generic fiber of this morphism we want it to be a smooth k3. Okay. We always take beta. We always take beta, the curve uh, the curve class beta to be in the kernel. Being the kernel of pi over star, so we denote it by denote it by beta in H two x z pi. So we are thinking of curve classes in the ambient threefold, where the, the curve class comes from homology theory of the fiber. So we look at H2 of the fibers, and that embeds inside H2 of the threefold. And we're looking at that piece inside H2 of the threefold that comes from K3 fiber. Another way of saying it is that if you project things down on the curve, you want the image to vanish. OK, so the virtual dimension Virtual dimension virtual dimension of PNS beta is zero for such curve classes regardless. X 
16 with Kalabi out. The zero dimensionality of the virtual cycle has to do with serial of course. But if X is not a Calabiot, this is what we discussed also in the sheaf theoretic case. When your um, sheaves are supported on the fiber, if you are in a situation that somehow your curve classes are always coming from homology theory of the fibers, you can see that F times omega or complex defined by O to F, the stable pair, times omega will be isomorphic to I, that complex. And uh, this gives you serial. <coughs> and you don't need omega to be trivial in that case. Exactly the same way that we had for torsion sheaf invariance supported on the KT fiber where the canonical bundle was coming from, from the base and our sheaves were supported on the fiber. So F times the canonical bundle, because it was coming from the base, it was equal to the F. F times omega was the same as that. Same, same thing happens in here. So now let me talk about generating series. Generating series of these invariants. So we have, we can fix the curve class and define a generating series for all n and beta, and we can ask some formal variable q keep track of the Euler characteristic of our sheath in the stable pair. We call that PTXT. And then we can also add over all beta um, um, that come from the, the fiber classes. PTX beta, and we um, call that parameter that keeps track of the curve classes T. So it's a double sum. It's a double sum, and now I can define the main theorem. Uh, just to make sure, so. So, so, uh, so you can see the only curve classes and fibers, but do you identify classes uh, uh, if they are uh, on the base? If, uh, if they are equivalent in the total space, but they are different fibers, uh, are they identical? Yes, they, yes. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are also identical. Yeah, but I mean, your sheaf cannot be supported on two fibers. Right, I, I'm just, well, I'm just, just I, 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 my question is that, so exactly what is the summing over beta? Uh, if two classes, uh, two beta, two different beta slides in different, different yes, they, I, I, uh, yes, they exactly. as yes, yes, total yes, space, yes. they regard it as the same class. Okay, good questions. I mean, the thing is that our calculation eventually boils down to something over a generic K3 surface and some extra contribution, exactly like what we had for torsion sheet invariants. And only one generic smooth K3 fiber is enough to give you parameterization of all curve classes. So yes, we identify them. Yeah. It's a non-isotrivial smooth K3 fibration. Their homology classes are the same. But they are not the same surfaces. It's not a trivial fibration, but it's a non-trivial smooth fibration. Okay. I'm a little bit curious about what happens to monotronic effect to the sum. If you move, move back to the. But this is just a, some detail. Um, don't know. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. So, um, now let me give you the main theorem. Theorem 1. Let pi from x to c be a smooth k3 vibration um, and beta be the fiber class uh, that we had be an irreducible curve class 
in an irreducible, irreducible curve class. Now we would like to restrict to those curve classes which are irreducible. Then we have the following formula. That PTX of beta, the one where you fix the curve class beta, is given by n equal to 0 infinity and h, h equal to 0 infinity, n equal to 1 minus h, also to infinity, 1 minus 1 to the n minus 1 Euler characteristic of PNK3. H and L pi H and beta Q to the N. Irreducible curve class it just means representable by irreducible. Yes. And this is the one that we studied last time, the Nobel Lapsus number. <coughs> You fix the you fix a curve class, and you look at for one k three fiber you can fix a curve class, and there's a modulus of hydrostructures structures for that one k three surface, and for every fixed curve class there's a nodal Lefschetz divisors inside that modulus space, and for the whole vibration there's also a pi relative vibration is called pi. There's a pi relative modulus of hydrostructures. structures. And for fixed curve class, there's also a pi relative nodal Lefschetz divisor inside that modulized space. And the base curve of the vibration gets mapped to that pi relative modulized space. And if this was the pi relative modulized space of Hodge structures, there are these nodal Lefschetz divisors inside here, divisors of the nodal Lefschetz for some fixed curve class beta. And the base curve C gets mapped in here, it has a one-dimensional image, and it intersects these at some loci. And the intersection number of the image of this section map, the image of curve inside here, gives you the nodal Lefschetz number. We discussed this in detail in the previous talk, and I'm not going to detail because the exact same uh, thing happens in here. Okay. Um, and you can see that this is very similar to previous sheaf theory that I mentioned. Even though our sheaves had nothing to do with sheaves in here, they, they were supposed to be supported on two dimensions on the whole fiber. Now we have much kind of delicate situation. Our sheaves are supported on curves inside the fiber and so on. Yes, the generating series of the PT invariants kind of exhibits some similar behavior to the generating series of torsion two dimensional sheaf invariants. Back then we had. P DT invariants given by some Euler characteristic of some different scheme of the fiber that is replaced by Euler characteristic of the modulized space of a stable pairs on that fiber. And we also have the extra contributions of the nodal Lefschetz numbers. So same exact thing happens in here. And this similarity is beautiful. I will tell you why. So you can investigate why. I mean, the fact that you can compute things and you can see that the both of the theories exhibit the same behavior, but also you can kind of zoom out and think of, could I have guessed that these two behave in a similar way? And they do. And it will tell you why is this beautiful. OK. So now, let me say something about these. Of course, in the past, we had different scheme invariants. And we can calculate those numbers, Hilbert's scheme of points on a smooth surface. Those are given by Gauche invariants. And we can look at the paper of Gauche and we can find all of those invariants. They have, in fact, they are in fact given by modular forms. We can read off Gauche invariants from some modular forms. These invariants, these are not Hilbert schemes, these are different, but these are also readable from some other formula. So the Euler characteristic. The characteristics um, gamma Pn K3 
HPH can be read off from Hawaii to the Shoka So what is that formula? This is the formula. So minus one, what I have over there in my generating series. Um, y to the n and q to the h. There is this generating series of these other characteristics that Kawai and Shuk have studied. And that's given by a beautiful thing, the modular form. Oh, minus minus y, minus 1 over minus y, minus 2, a from 1 to infinity, on 1 over 1 minus q to the 20, 1 plus y to the times qn, and 1 plus y inverse times qn squared. You expand the right-hand side of this equation, and you equate terms of some, same degree in N and H. That gives you coefficients on this side. Give you these. How do they prove it? Oh. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I do not. Uh, so they, they also studied, I think, I don't know if they're the ones who studied these things at Hilbert schemes or so I can tell you, I don't know, I don't remember how they did it, but the thing is that this is also a certain Hilbert scheme. Um, when you are fixing the curve class, okay, so by the way, this H is the self-intersection number of uh, the curves. So let's say I give you some curve, which is inside H2 part of the surface, with integral coefficients, such that there's the self-intersection number is 2h minus 2. So this h keeps track of that. Okay. The thing is that as soon as you fix this curve class, there is this moduli space, you can identify it with a certain Hilbert scheme. So for this fixed curve class, you can look at the Hilbert scheme of curves with class beta on this on S. And there is a universal curve that, that this is associated with. And it turns out that this moduli space of the stable pairs is a relative Hilbert scheme, a bunch of points on this universal curve class over the Hilbert scheme of curves. So point-wise, for every point in here, which gives you one of those curves with that given class, your module, the fiber of this moduli space over that particular curve is a Hilbert scheme of points on that curve. And when you move over the, all of them, the universal curve, it gives you the graph of Hilbert scheme of points. So, via the study of Hilbert scheme of points, you can compute invariants like that. But I don't know, I don't remember, is this work of PT also, Andre Pondi and Thomas, and they just did calculations, or that they actually did study these Hilbert schemes? I don't remember. About that. Do you need white culture? Hmm? We are asking to you, white culture. Yes, yes, yes. Do you do that? I did. Yes. I did, and uh, he says he gives a talk in Colombia, <laughs> and then he will be here maybe either on Wednesday or Thursday. As soon as he tells me, I'll be there. structure of these stable pair invariants. And now, in my talk, in my the two lectures on these stable pair theories, one of them was the identity about the stable pair invariants, which I told you about. And I told you how you to read out these numbers from Kawaii Oshika formula. There's also another identity. So main result, maybe a number x2, is the following. This is Product 
expansion formula. Um, let x be a smooth um, projected collabial threefold, which admits um, a K3 vibration. Now we are in a situation where we have a K3 vibration on the curve, and I want my x also to be collabial. From not, I mean, these things I put for here, in here, they didn't need collabial property. This one I want. Let's say, um, pencil of cortex inside P3 times P1, right? And that's an example. That's just pencil of cortex. Um, your your K3 vibration here is still smooth K3 vibration. No, that vibration actually has finitely many nodal fibers, but then again, we can smoothen things out using degenerations. So the smooth project, I mean the smooth vibration for us also here means that the generic fiber is a smooth. So that doesn't contradict. Um, which admits a K3 vibration, which admits a K3 vibration pi x to P1, such that every fiber, every fiber is an integral of scheme. Okay, so we have the reduced and irreducible fibers. Later, we show that using wall crossing uh, techniques. And Sebi Soybillman and Jules and Song, mainly developed also by Yokino Butoda, who is expert on constructing wall crossing calculations by perturbing a certain notion of weak stability condition. Well, not the stability, but weak stabilities, um, we can express, can express uh, the generating series in the reading series of PT invariants for fixed curve class beta, as well as PT of x when we add over all beta in terms of generalized Donaldson Thomas invariance, which I will call them R Beta n, these are rational numbers which count semi stable sheets sheets, let's call them F with churn character. Or maybe I call them E with chain character. Zero R times class of the fiber. This is the fiber class. Beta and N. These are cohomology classes. Your, your lecture today so far, uh, 
we, we didn't see the stability structure really come in, right? We just, we just no, no. yes, there. later we will see. Well, but presumably some, somewhere hit the Our stable pair invariants are equipped with the stability conditions that I discussed, co kernel being zero dimensional. Well, that's, that's a stability condition. That's a stability condition. If someone asks you, what's the stability condition for PT stable pairs, you would say co kernel zero dimension. I mean, usually we think of, you know, you compare some quantity with a quotient objects or a sub objects, a kind of stability condition. That is precise. That's <coughs> correct. Well, that, that, that the stable pair invariants, that's right. So not only you can do that for objects and sub objects, you can do it also in here. In, in general, if you have maps <coughs> between sheets like that, um, okay. So this is a long story. There is this stability condition which kind of is even more general than Lipotia. Lipotia studied the stability conditions for a shift together with sections like that. Some vector bundle times O and a shift. Okay? And this dimension of this thing was the dimension of the Hilbert polynomial of this shift basically. Um, so if you have something like that, Lipotier study much like this of these guys, pairs like that, Lipotier pairs. And what I'm trying to say is that you can also forget about this guy being a trivial sheaf, and you can just put in some torsion-free sheaf in here, which is not trivial. And you can extend the Lipotier stability condition to something called Schmidt's stability condition. Alexander Schmidt is the one who actually did it. But all in all, that stability condition is exactly something that you study it via looking at sub-objects and quotient objects. So stability condition entails the following. So if you have some sub-object, let's say you are fixing this one. In, in our case, this is fixed. It's just O. But your shift could be anything. If you are looking at some sub-sheet in here, the stability condition tells you that Hilbert polynomial, reduced Hilbert polynomial of this thing want to be less than reduced Hilbert polynomial of this. And if it is something that it's a subsheaf of this guy such that this factors through it, we want some identity to be to hold. Um, yeah, it's a longer story, but that's what it is. So basically, Let's say I have a subsheaf in here. I want to say that polynomial of G divided by rank of G, I want that to be less than um, some parameter Q plus Q of F divided by rank of F. If S does not factor through G, and I want Q plus Q of G divided by rank of G to be less than Q plus Q of F divided by rank of F otherwise. So this is this is the Potier stability condition. So, so I see, and also, since you mentioned Hilbert, uh, Hilbert polynomial, so uh, uh, ample polynomial is also part of it. Yes, yes, yes. So all questions yes. correspond that's to very, very that's correct. the choice of that's the choice. That's correct. Um, ah, okay. So this wall crossing, though, this is, this is different. This is different. This is, different. This is a wall crossing of weak stability conditions, each of which are related to these stability conditions. I mean, this is way more complicated. I will discuss it. It's not that. But to, to answer your question, yes. It's true that I told you the stable pairs have the property that their co-kernel is zero dimension. But why is that a stability condition? You're right. It's something, some criteria like this, numerical criteria, which gives you a comparison between sub-object and the object. Sub-object in here could be two things. Either the sheet factors through this thing or not. If it factors through, we want this inequality. If it doesn't factor through, we want this inequality. OK. That's just the Lipotier. Now you have a range of possibilities for this parameter. You can make the parameter to be very small, in which case Lipotier stability uh, asymptotically converges to Joyston stability. Or you can ask parameter to be very large. For example, it could be a 
some large polynomial with positive co leading coefficient. If that's the case, same stability condition in here forces the co kernel of that section to be zero dimensional. What's Q in this picture? Q -dimensional. Stability parameter. How much is one? The stability parameter for this is stability criteria. So for pairs like this, we have a notion of Hilbert polynomial of a pair. Right. And that, that is some new notion which has a Q in it. It's a parameter. You know, any stability I'm related to solving some equations. Uh, that's right. That's concerned. right. So that means that one power family of equations that appears. This was, uh, I think, Wenworth, Richard Wenworth, 20 years ago, and one of the guys who also studied this uh, uh, one power family of, of equations which related to stability also. So this must mean in this situation that there's a one power family of that's right. In, in the case, I think this study was actually related to a bundle uh, with recession. That's correct. This is exactly that. This is exactly that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. This is exactly that. Richard Benner. Richard yes, Benner. yes, yes, yes. I know. Yes. Uh, uh, one other guy. Uh, it could be any person. It could be Garcia Prada. It could be Bradlow. No, no, no. Some guy in Brown. Uh, in Brown. Oh, it does come Oh, yeah, that's Columbus. Columbus. Uh -huh. That's correct. Yes. They did it. Uh, Memory was, was, was here at that point as an assistant Oh, okay. That's about 20 years ago. Were you here? I was here 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that means 25 years ago. Memory <laughs> <laughs> was here. They were studying that. So, yes, so you take a look at that. So yeah. it could be related to this. In this, this picture is really the same as the stability of bundles with sections on a curve. It's except that. Right, right, right. That they were also studying exactly. curve, right? You bundle yeah. over curve, and then. This is the only difference in here is that we push forward the curve yeah. into the threefold. Right. And so we just, we just look at the Hilbert polynomials. Instead of the degree and the rank of the bundle, we look at the Hilbert polynomial yes. inside the area. So there must be something related to that. Yeah. 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 They were studying intrinsic the bundle over the curve, but now you push for the graph. Yeah. So maybe it's a link with graph. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so, so what is this? You said it's one primary family equation. Equations. Equations where? You can define Young Mills equations kind of coupled with the. the These are the different, differential equations. Differential equations. Uh huh. Yeah. Differential equations coupled with uh, uh, the session. Yeah, so the, the, the differential equation involves both the connection and the right, session. Right, right. Yeah. Involves the session. And so you, you, there's a, some coupling constant you put in. When the constant move around, you get, you, you get different stability. Uh huh. Perfect. Yeah, very interesting. So it should be similar to here. Yeah. So, so they, they, they are not, not uh, so it's a, well, I see it's kind of gay, gay theory, but, but not a pure gay theory. Well, gay theory plus session. Plus session. Plus session. Yeah. Okay, so there are also gay theories with framing, so. That's the same thing. Um, but it's a, that one is a co-section, so I guess that from your shift to trivial trivialization, some bundle or whatever, or a shift. Um, okay, so these count semi-stable sheaves, and the, the, that was the class of the fibers. So theorem two is that P G of X, the one I defined is the following product. Exponential minus one to the n minus one j r beta r plus n q to the n t to the beta n plus two r times um, product over uh, r bigger than zero is strictly Everything is bigger than zero. Exponential minus one to the n minus one. Up 
Objects in here look like stable parent variants. Sheaves in here are supported on curves. And the curves are lying inside K3 fibers of a given K3 fibration. Objects in here, on the other hand, are sheaves supported on the fibers. So this is a duality between one-dimensional sheaves and two-dimensional sheaves. For this particular one, we use wall plastics. So this is the second result I will be discussing maybe next time or maybe the time after that. So um, we use wall crossings of Joy Song that is considered Soberman, but also everything, I mean, it has the same flavor as Joy Song and Conservative Soberman, but for example, for case of uh, Conservative Soberman, their stability conditions are type of the like original type of stabilities, but Joy Song stability is not the original type of stability. It's a weaker stability, so we use weaker stabilities. Um, so if I want to summarize the results of these two, three lectures, we would like to say the following. So PT3 of X relative to this space curve C via this duality is related to DT theory of X relative to the base curve C. Relative means that we have sheaves supported on the fibers. And that's, that's also in here. We have pairs whose sheaf is supported on the fiber. Or we have sheets who are supported on the fibers. And this is a proof of this duality. And then we have marginal forms in here. And we have the content of the today's lecture and the following two lectures will be establishing a, this arrow. Also, this one we already talked about in the previous lectures. So this one is kind of was motivated as we saw, as we saw, was motivated by S duality. And we proved it. We even wrote, wrote down the marginal forms. Connections between marginal forms and DT series. This one which is content of this equation here, this one is motivated by T blank. And this one, which we try to give an answer to for restricted class of curves. So this is the content of these three lectures where I want my curves to be first of all the reducible curve classes that I give you the proof. And for reducible curve classes, not all reducible curve classes, we cannot do that. Just particular reducible curve classes, which I discuss about later. So partially, we establish this correspondence. OK? Hmm? This one? PT? No, the OK, so if you ask me what is T-duality? No, just in the present. In the present context, is the duality between one-dimensional sheaf invariance, D2 brain theory, and D4 brain theory. I see. But that involves the fiber. Yeah. Um, it involves the elliptic curve. Hmm? Does it involve the elliptic fiber? No. Of the no, it doesn't. So how is it done? Well, if you ask me about T duality, I will. I will just. The only way I can no, understand. No, picture. Yeah. The only way I can understand T duality, at least very intuitively speaking, I understand it by Fourier Mukai transforms. Ah, okay. So that's the shift. Yeah. For the Q3. If you, you give me a shift purely supported on a, on a complex fiber, on a yeah. K3 surface, I can apply Fourier Mukai transforms to that, model, to that drive category, and I can map via Mukai flipping, right? If you give me a sheet with a certain Mukai vector, I can send that to a sheet which is supported on a point. That's supposedly related to some flapping structure in the uh, in the model form that you're training. Yeah. Uh, I would ask you, is there an aggregation with geometric numbers? 
Any relation to geometric dynamics? <coughs> I, I don't know. The question is hard for me. So here just means it's modular. Yes. This is S plurality modularity property. That's right. It's not a generic S plurality. Yeah. So, can I ask a more philosophical question, maybe? So, last time that I heard a talk about curve counting on K3 surfaces, like, it only depended on the class and stuff. So, it seems to me like, are the, you know, curve countings on the fibers, are all the fibers the same from the point of view of curve counting? Yes, right, that's right. So, so the thing is that in here, we are fixing curve classes that still come from the fiber, right? So you start from a cohomology class of the curve, right? And cohomology theory of the fiber surjects onto cohomology theory of the ambient triple. So you could have curve classes, cohomology curve classes, which could map to zero in the ambient triple. So what we really do, because it's a threefold theory, you start with some curve class gamma, which is coming from the fiber. Okay? And we, for these curve class gammas that we fix, we look at the modular space of the stable pair invariants. And this modular space is kind of related to the modular space of the stable pair invariants on the fiber. So the difference between what we had before and now is that we could have curves with a given curve class that have thickenings outside of the fiber. So it's not just purely a two-dimensional theory. Right. It's a hybrid theory. Yeah, that's my question. So the difference yeah. is that you can see like curves that have thickenings. Exactly. Outside of it. Exactly. But is this different than looking at I don't know like uh, curve counting on a K three plus curve counting on that K three like a thickened version of that K three plus curve counting on like the triple thickening of that K three or something like that? Is it just <clears throat> so it is it is related to that. Yes, these nodal Lepschitz numbers basically do that. The nodal Lepschitz number because you're right. I mean the thing is that you fix a curve class. You want this to be a one-one class, right? Okay. So now you are also giving the possibility that this K3 fiber could have infinitesimal deformations, and you are asking exactly that question: Is under this deformation does the curve remain one-one or not? Well, sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Where it does remain 1-1, one, one, that gives you a connected component for the modular space of these curves. And this connected component induces a connected component in the modular space of the stable pairs whose underlying curve has that class. Or that the curve does not remain 1-1. One, one. That's an isolated component for which the induced modular space of the stable pairs literally just is the stable pairs on that surface. So that's a fully twofold theory. The other one is twofold theory plus thickenings. And those nodal Lepschitz numbers capture both of these at the same time. So the nodal Lepschitz number is either one, which gives you the curve class if it is isolated, just remains one, one on one fiber only, or does it some number, which is given by excess intersections here. And that gets coupled with the invariance of the fiber modulizes. So you also said there were contributions from the singular fibers. Hmm? You also said there were contributions from singular fibers. You, you could have singular fiber theory, which I will discuss later, but I don't allow fibers to have as bad, if you like, singularities. I just allow rational double point singularities. But if you contribute some, uh, the curve class will always be something that's kind of the environment cycle. What is it? It's the environment. You are only counting contributions from some cycle on the singular fiber, but the environment. Yes, yes. So what I do is I use deformation invariant theories and degenerations. I start from a nodal vibration where my curve classes could be, well, my curves could be supported on some of the nodal fibers, maybe. Then out of this, I cook up some smooth K3 vibration whose theory I know. And then I relate the two theories via degeneration. But right here, the fibers are smooth, right? Yeah. Also, just to be clear, theorem 2 is PT of x, not PT of x real c. Yes, that's right. 
Uh, okay, good question. I mean, no, this is PD of XO. This. this is really, uh, what I mean is that curve classes come from the fiber. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was good. <clears throat> okay. Um, by the way, I should say that, um, so this thing, modular forms and this fiber-wise PT theory, this was studied in the work of Katz and Clem and Baha, who were looking at a kind of refined version of these relative PT variants. Refined here meaning motific. So motific approach to these things. And they calculated modular forms too. Also, Rahul and Richard used those very degeneration things that we use. I mean, they use it for a different purpose. Uh, to prove the KKB conjecture. A proof of KKB conjecture. Also use this correspondence. I'm not saying they use our result, I mean, actually they will doing it while we were working on, on these, but for a different purpose. But their result is also about that arrow. They didn't use our results, but there are some similarities. Um, Sorry, is the K3B conjecture about XLC or about K3 surfaces? About K3 surfaces. Okay. About K3 surfaces. So in order to get a count of the K3 surface, all, all curve classes on the K3 surface, they were looking at this K3 times C. For this non-compact Calabiao or compact Calabiao, I think their C was compact. Yeah, okay. So K3 times C, or maybe it was just a non-compact one. I don't remember. So they were embedding it K3 inside some ambient threefold, and they were using the general. So they captured the proof of KKV conjecture by studying threefold theories cooked up from the K3 surface itself. So, sorry, I don't mean to take you too far off topic, but okay. if you're interested in curve cutting on K3, why embed it in a why they were uh, interested? I mean, it's detailed, yeah, I mean, detailed. You remember, we were both in that bedroom talk, right? Richard gave, and it's beautiful, right? It's a method of approach. But, yeah, we were originally interested in threefold theory. Like when you embed it into a switchboard, then the virtual dimension is zero. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. It could be. It could be. But virtual dimension over K3 is also zero. For stable parent variants. I mean. There is the modified space of the stable pairs uh, on the K3 has two different deformation obstruction theories. One of them is to think of the stable pairs as Shiban sections, which is kind of a more sophisticated way of looking at code schemes, for example, things like that. These are not code schemes, right? I mean, they're a little bit farther from being a code scheme because the section map is not subjective, but essentially subjective. But, anyways, there are two different theories. One of them is you can count invariance of modulus of sheaf and sections that has its own deformation obstruction theory. That's an intrinsic one. Or the one that PT suggests, which is counting uh, them as objects in the draft category in which your deformation obstruction theory is hum i dot comma i dot. Now that hum i dot comma i dot does satisfy their duality. Because if you're on K3, right? If you're on K3, X2 I dot comma I dot is the same as hum I dot I dot. Ah, okay. Now I understand what the point is. The point is that on K3, this uh, deformation uh, obstruction complex is a three term thing. So, yeah, you're right. It's not self symmetric because you have hum and X1 and X2, and that's it. And whereas in, in, in threefold case, 
you have a two-term complex. You have HOM, X1, X2, X3. You can get rid of the automorphisms and their duals, and you have a self-symmetric. So yeah, you run. This is good. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyhow. Um, so I have little time, so I will finish up to wherever I finish in 15 minutes, and then we leave it for next session. So given pi x to c and s o x to f, where class of f is beta h2 x to pi, and all the characteristics of the sheaf is n, and co-kernel of s is zero dimensional. Everything I talked about today was giving you an introduction about PT theories and what are the things that we want to prove. So I'm just starting now by, by writing down some of those. So we let P denote this modular space who is uh, associated with associated with universal family. Universal family I dot, which is given by OX times P and some universal sheaf together with the universal section. They actually, you need to actually prove that if you have something like this representing this two term complex, given this information, you can recover the sheaf and the section and the other one. That's obvious. Because these are objects in the drive category. And uh, the object in the drive category does not necessarily see the section. Everything is there up to the quasi isomorphism. It could be an object which is 27 terms or something. So actually, there is some proof that goes into this that it always stays as a as some two term kind of a two term complex representing the sheaf and the section. OK, so now let us denote these natural maps to the moduli space i to x by pi of x and pi of p. There is a theorem, which is by, um, I can call it theorem 2. This is by pt, 2009. There is a Perfect information obstruction theory on P, which is given by this complex object in the drive category, R hump pi P over star, R pi P over star of R hump, I dot, I dot, omega. I P trace three part shifted by two to L dot of P truncated cotending complex. This means trace three. You see, when you think of objects as objects in the drive category, it's very similar to the information obstruction theory of sheets. So this is some theory because I mean this modular space of the stable pairs has two different types of drive structures, and uh, this is not the most natural one. There are two drive structures which both kind of are the same in the level of tangent spaces, in the level of deformation spaces, but they have different obstructions. The one, the natural one. It has obstructions to obstructions and obstructions to obstructions. But this one, whose obstruction theory is only different, it, course, uh, it kind of coincides with the previous one in the level of deformations, but different obstructions. So this counting objects in the draft category was a really brilliant idea to overcome the problem of a non-perfect, but yet natural, obstruction theory for these pairs. 
So this one's the perfect theory, the other one is not. Okay, so that's that. Now there is a proposition. Suppose beta is one of these fiber wise curve classes is irreducible. This is the first thing we will be studying. Then for this particular one, I can show H1 of E dot dual. What this is, this is the um, sheaf cohomology. Cohomology for the complex object in the drive category is the sheaf cohomology. And this it spits out a sheaf, which is the obstruction sheaf. This is isomorphic to R0 pi over star. This is the sheaf hull. I just wanted to point out that this is the relative sheaf hull. It's not ideal sheaf. I dot is the complex. All this I dot is the complex. Yeah, the to, to, the, to the stable pair. You see, this one, there is some theory for this threefold where it's, uh, it's deformation in space is hum i dot f, it's obstruction in space is x1 i dot f, but then there is x2 i dot f. And that's not a two term thing. That's the natural one, which is non perfect. The brilliance of PT is that instead of that, they constructed some other obstruction theory whose deformations are given by x1 i dot i dot, obstructions are given by x2 i dot i dot, but x1 i dot i dot matches with harm i dot f, the natural one. x2 doesn't. Obstructions here are different. But the feature of this theory is that it's a perfect theory, whereas this one is not a perfect. Doesn't that mean you be counting different objects? Yes, you're counting different objects. On one of the cases, you're not counting even. But you're like partially having the condition shown. Yes. Works in the drive. Yes. Yeah. So, but the feature of this in here is that if your curve classes are irreducible, obstruction sheaf is given by this sheaf hall. Um, this is not related to classical things. This is related to my talk today and in the following lectures. It just happens that when curve class is irreducible, obstruction sheaf of this guy matches with this, this guy. The dual to this tangent to space to the, modul the natural intrinsic modular space of the stable space. Okay? And then I have Maybe five more minutes, or maybe even less. Let me see where to finish this thing. Um, so what is proof of this thing? I can just say proof, essentially, I don't prove it. Essentially, involves showing that, showing that there is a, this map from H1 of E dot dual to x relative x3 pi k f i dot is an isomorphism. This is a proof. And then by a third duality, this is the isomorphic to um, relative harm um, i dot f i dot. This is said duality, fiber by said duality. And this is kind of involved, so this is detailed. 
circle diagram tracings and so on. But, okay, so we have this obstruction theory for threefold, and the first result we want is that the obstruction sheaf of this obstruction theory, this is the one that captures hum on the on and all the higher degrees. This thing matches with this guy. Next time, I will show you how to use this to prove that our invariants are given by products of nodal leftist numbers and certain smooth modulized cases on each K3 file. I think I stopped here. Five minutes break. Oh,